Hello, all. Uh, welcome to XDC. I hope everybody is having a good conference. Um, as announced, my name is Jason Extra, and I'm going to be talking about ray tracing. Um, so I'd like to start off with a little bit about me. Um, most of you have heard of me by now, but if you haven't, uh, my name is Jason Extrans. Um, I am employed by Intel to work on 3D graphics drivers. Um, I have been kicking around free desktop since 2013. Um, and these days I work on basically everything that's Intel graphics drivers, but not, I try to avoid OpenGL. Um, so I work on a compiler stack. I work on Iris a little bit if I have to. I work on a Vulkan driver. Um, most of my focus is on Vulkan, uh, but I also dabble in basically everything that needs dabbling. Um, so last XDC, I gave a talk on ray tracing in Vulkan. Um, I am not going to rehash everything in that talk. So if you are confused, um, feel free to go back to last year's and watch that talk, and hopefully that will help give you some of the background. I'm going to try to hit the major points, but I'm not going to go into detail about what ray tracing is or all of the details about how Vulkan exposed it. That was last year's talk. This year's talk is about how we go about implementing that in an actual driver. So without further ado, let's get started. So the uh, first tricky bit about ray tracing is that it involves this concept of shader calls. Um, as a quick recap, uh, shader calls are, you have these special kinds of shaders called callable shaders. And when you create your Vulkan pipeline, you give it all of the possible callable shaders as one giant mega pipeline. Um, Vulkan actually has a pipeline library thing, so you can do your compiles in pieces and then piece them all together. But the VK pipeline that you have to work with from the API point of view contains, potentially contains all of the shaders. Um, it's up to the driver how much compilation it does with all of them, but it's all available. Um, when you go to do a Vulkan ray tracing dispatch, all the callable shaders that are going to be used for that entire dispatch operation are provided via a set of shader binding tables, or SBTs. Uh, this binding table is a chunk of GPU visible memory that has been filled out with shader group handles, which are queried from the pipeline. So you have your callable shaders, they are come in groups, and then you query these handles, which is some uh, 32 bytes of data, and then you fill out the shaded by binding table with that data. And the handles are what the hardware actually uses to figure out which one of the bazillion of shaders you have to go ahead and call. Um, in any way tracing shader stage, you can call a callable shader via the op execute callable opcode in SPOVI, which maps to execute callable ext in GLSR. Um, to pass data between the shaders, there are variables that are decorated with a callable data storage class. There's actually two storage classes. There's callable data and there's incoming callable data. Callable data is the one used in the callee, or in the caller rather, and incoming callable data is the one used in the callee. And these two variables in the two different shaders alias each other and that's how you pass data back and forth. Um, once a callable shader completes, control flow returns to the calling shader. So it's basically like a function call, only it's a shader call. So what do these actually map to in, in, in hardware? So for the Intel ray tracing implementation, we have this new thing called bindless thread dispatch. So in the compute walker command, which is the uh, command that we actually emit into the command buffer to do a compute shader, um, there is a new bindless thread dispatch mode. And this mode does a couple of things. Uh, for one thing, it shuts off shared memory. Um, there's no concept of a local work group in bindless dispatch. Uh, and there's also no concept of a local work group in Vulkan ray tracing. Uh, so we don't have shared memory accessible. The other thing it does is it generates a set of thread IDs, um, one thread ID for each invocation. And these are used to track various things as you go through the flow. Um, 
It also, I think, turns on some other magic hardware bits that make bindless dispatch possible. Uh, I'm not sure what all goes into that mode. Um, then each callable shader is represented by something called a bindless shader record. Uh, this is exactly your uh, handle. That's Well, the handle is actually made up of multiple bindless shader records. But um, you get a bindless shader record. And this is just a little bit of data that contains shader start address, SIMD size, and the local data offset. Um, the bindless shader record is the bindless equivalent of a like our 3D state PS packet for setting up pixel slash fragment shaders. Only it's for the bindless ones, and it's much, much smaller. And then bindless shaders can be invoked from either another bindless shader or one of these, or a compute shader dispatched with this bindless thread mode um, using the BTD spawn message. Uh, the BTD spawn message is a send message just like any other message in Intel hardware, which communicates with something outside of the EU. And it takes a few things. It takes a pointer to a bindless shader record. It takes the thread ID that was passed in. And it also takes a global memory offset, which I didn't, a global memory address, which I didn't say here. Um, the thread ID is passed around explicitly for some hardware reason that I don't understand. In theory, the hardware could probably pluck it out of the shader itself somehow because it knows all that information, but it's passed along explicitly. Um, and then to kill your thread, you emit a BTD spawn message with the retire bit set. So um, when you pass it the pointer to the bindless shader record, the bottom bit of that pointer is the retire bit. And that if that bit is set, then it ignores the rest of the pointer and kills the thread. And then when you do a compute walker with this new mode, instead of waiting for that particular shader to complete, it waits for all of the spawned threads to be retired. So there's a different termination condition that's also associated with that mode. And that's it. That is our ray tracing hardware. Um, it's really quite simple. And everything that we do in the Vulkan API has to be mapped to this. Um, the shaders themselves are pretty bare bones. Like I said, uh, you have a thread idea, you have a global data pointer, you have a local data pointer. Um, the local data pointer is the bindless shader record address of the bindless shader record that was used to dispatch the current bindless shader, plus the local data offset that was provided in the bindless shader record. Um, and this is used for implementing uh, some of the storage classes that we have in bindless shaders. Um, it's useful to be able to get at your own BSR. Um, and then, like I said, this is this is it. We it's up to us to build the ray tracing API out of this primitive. Um, okay, hopefully that goes. Uh, okay, so how do we map this to Vulkan? So one thing to notice is that there's no BTD return message. Uh, there's no call stack. There's nothing like that which we have available to us. This is the the bindless shader call is the or the bindless spawn is the only message that we have. So we have to man manage the stack ourselves. Um, I don't know why it thinks I need subtitles. I hope that goes away. Um, we we have to manage the stack ourselves. This means we have to spill and fill around shader calls. Anything that's on the stack we want accessible after the shader call we have to spill. Um, we have to stash and any return address, the, the return final shader record address, and any call parameters. Um, all that we have to do ourselves. We then use the BTD spawn message to launch the child shader. And when we go to return, we have to BTD spawn to launch a return shader. And then we have to deal with all the stack unwind. Um, importantly, we don't have a return that returns back to the original shader binary. It actually invokes a whole new shader. Um, this means, oh, a second, let me see if I can kill my subtitle, Let's kill this subtitles thing. I don't know. Um, uh, nope. 
There we go. Thank you. Okay, so how do we actually do this? Um, let's say we have a simple shader that calls one other shader. Um, so we have the shader main, it does some stuff, it calls a shader child, and then it does some more stuff before it ends. We have to split change this into what in functional programming is called continuation passing style, where we have we start off with our shader, we split our shader main into main zero and main one, where main zero does its first bit of stuff, pushes the stack, pushes the bindless thread address of main one onto the stack, and then spawns child. And then child does its stuff, and then it pops the return address off the stack and spawns main one, or spawns whatever that address is, which main zero put it onto the stack, put main one onto the stack. So the thing that gets spawned there is main one, and then it pops the stack, does its stuff, and then does the retire. So we end up splitting main zero into two different shaders, um, one which does the first half and then does the call, and then the second shader does the second half and then retires. And then child gets called into, and then it looks on the stack to see where it should call when it's done, and that's how we get to main one. So that's the way that returns are handled. Um, this is obviously the most simple possible case that you can imagine of a single shader that has no control flow and calls a single other shader. Um, so what happens if we have control flow? Uh, there is code for this. It is complicated. Uh, if ladders are pretty easy to imagine, you can imagine sort of getting back into an if ladder by just smashing all of the if conditions to a previous to the previously known values for that continue point and uh, letting the if ladder collapse. That's not particularly difficult. Um, loops get tricky. Nested loops get even trickier. Um, I'm not going to try to go into all of those details because uh, see also the emoji. But um, it, it all can be done. It can be done with structured control flow. We have a pass for it which if you are interested in those details, I recommend you go read the code instead of me trying to go through it in PowerPoint slides because it's going to be much more clear that way. Um, this path that we have is called no lower shader calls. Uh, originally, I wrote it to be kind of Intel specific, but then uh, Boss wanted to use it for RADV, and so he pulled it out and he generalized it a little bit. It was already fairly general. We just had to tweak things a little bit. Um, this, this pass has two new no intrinsics. It has RT execute callable, which is different from the execute callable that you get out of Spovy, um, because we want to be able to sort of denote the things that are happening before and after the lowering. Um, this takes a shader binding table index and a pointer to the payload. It's assumed that the shader binding table is magically bound somewhere or somehow. Um, and it takes, and then we have an RT resume. And this is more of a marker than an instruction. Um, so this marks the resume point. We use it when we are in the middle of the lowering pass to mark all of our resume points. Uh, we also use it afterwards to give us a shader that then gets lowered into a stack pop. But it really isn't, doesn't do anything. It's more of a marker than anything else. Uh, both intrinsics have a pair of constants associated with them. Uh, a call index, which is the call in the original shader that this pertains to, and a stack size, which is the stat size of the stack in bytes at that shader call. Um, and these are important because when you have everything split into 16 different shaders, because you've got a bunch of different calls at different points and you have to split everything up, um, having this call index helps you track which thing goes where. Uh, and the stack size, uh, is useful for the push and pop operations. Uh, the input of no lower shader calls is a single no shader. The output is as many no shaders as is required for uh, the function, the, the call return handling. Then uh, once we've done that, then we have a new pass, BOW no lower RT intrinsics, which lowers those no intrinsics into Intel intrinsics. So when we see the RT execute callable intrinsic, we do a few things. Uh, we place the return shader, finally shader record address 
and the address of the payload on the stack. Um, those are treated as sort of the first elements of the stack of the called shader. And then we modify the per thread stack offset. So we push the stack. Um, we, in, our, in our scratch memory for ray tracing, we have a small area called the hot zone that contains a few different things. Uh, but one of the things that it contains is a per thread stack offset. And so we modify that offset to push the stack. And then the called shader will read that offset to figure out where the stack is. Um, we then insert a BTD spawn message to start the callable. But the BTD spawn doesn't actually kill our shader. And because we're, because shaders um, operate in waves, where you have multiple invocations going at one time, we might not have all of the invocations calling that particular callable. So we can't just kill the whole thread at that point. We go ahead and do the BTD spawn, which schedules the next shader. And then we do a no jump halt, which causes all of the currently active invocations to jump to the end of the shader and wait for the shader to end. Um, any inactive invocations will go on to the next else or break out of the loop or whatever it is that those invocations are going to do. And they may end up calling other shaders at other points inside of the the shader that we're currently in. Um, but we have to kill the, current, the currently running invocations. Then we do a, so that, that takes care of uh, execute callable. For RT resume, mostly all we do is we read and modify the post-thread stack offset. So we pop the stack. Uh, but again, it's nice to have that RT resume because the RT resume carries along with it the stack size, so we know how far to pop the stack to get back to where we want to be for the, the resume shader. Um, so that's the basic flow for how we deal with the stack. Um, the next thing we have to deal with is callable shader IO. So um, in Vulkan, you have three new types of IO that are added for callable shaders. You have callable data KHR, which is a block that's passed to the callable shader. I mentioned that earlier. You have callable data KHR in the caller, and you have incoming callable data KHR in the callee. And those two blocks are supposed to alias each other, and that's the way the data is packs, passed up and down the stack. Um, so the way we do this is that the callable data KHR stuff, whatever that struct is, it goes on the stack somewhere, and we pass a pointer, and uh, the, in the, in the SPOVI, there's a pointer to that block that gets passed into the op execute callable. And then we pass it on down the stack. Um, incoming callable data, like I just said, it only exists in the called shader. It this is the callable data block passed to op execute callable. And you can read to get data from the caller or write to pass data, data back. So we don't have like return values. You just write data into the callable data block. And then we also have shader record buffer KHR. And this is basically acts like a little UBO that is placed right after the shader handle in the shader binding table. So shader binding tables, when you pass them into the API, you pass in a base address and a stride. And the stride may be bigger than the 32-byte handle size. Any data after that 32-byte handle shows up in this shader record buffer KHR binding. And this allows the application to um, not only have shaders, shader binaries associated with the handle, but also have some, some amount of data so that they can do their own sort of post-shader generalization stuff. Um, maybe you want to use the same shader for multiple different types of hits, just with a slightly different texture index or something. And so, you can accomplish that by placing data inside of this range that handle, happens after the handle, after the current handle, before the next handle in your shader binding table. And that's accessible via shader record buffer KHR. So how do we implement these? Um, so first thing we do is we lower each of the variables. So for callable data KHR, we just convert it to no var shader temp and stuff it on the stack somewhere. Um, and we don't actually have to do anything to stuff it on the stack. That'll kind of happen automatically when we assign variable locations. Um, 
So incoming callable data, we look at each variable dereference in the callable shader, and we replace that variable dereference with a cast from the pointer payload, the, the payload pointer. And the payload pointer, as I said earlier, has been stored as the first little bit of the stack of our shader, so we know where that is. We grab the payload data pointer, we cast it to a DREF, and we replace each of the variable DREF references that point to an incoming callable data with that. And in this way, we've tied the pointer in the callable data that came from the Novar shader temp to the pointer in the callee. Um, for shader record buffer, we do basically the same thing. We replace a variable D reference with a cast from a pointer, but this time we use the local data pointer. So a few slides ago, I talked about how we have this local data offset in our bindless shader record, and we use that. And then one of the things we get in our bindless thread payload is this local data pointer, which is the bindless shader record address plus that little offset. And that gives uh, gets us exactly to the shader record buffer data. Um, it's pretty nicely designed for precisely this kind of API. Once we've done the variable lowering, which is mostly just a sort of search and replace operation on the node, then we can go ahead and assign, assign I.O. locations, assign uh, size types, and call no lower explicit I.O. And that turns all of our I.O. into address calculations and global memory reads and writes, and done. All of our I.O. is taken care of. OK, so that's basically how callable shaders work. It's a little bit complicated to get the lowering right, but it's not terribly different from what you would expect on a CPU. Right, everything's implemented in terms of go to. It's just that we have to deal with a little bit more, a few more complexities thanks to waves and not actually being able to jump back to the original instruction. But otherwise, all of the stack push and pop stuff is exactly what you would expect from, say, a CPU compiler. So how do we actually ray trace with this map? So ray tracing shaders work exactly the same as callable shaders. I started with callable shaders because they're kind of the building block that then gets generalized into ray tracing shaders. So with ray tracing, you have a few different kinds of shaders. Um, you've got ray gen shaders, which is sort of the base of your ray tracing shader. And Technically, these are callable shaders. Um, they may also be compute shaders depending on some hand wavy details. Um, you also have any hit, closest hit, miss, and intersection shaders. And all of these are callable shaders. Um, so they're provided as part of your shader groups. Um, you get handles to them. You create shader binding tables. You pass those in, um, and then based off of the different geometry indexes in the acceleration structure, when you hit a triangle, it will call the appropriate hit shaders based off of that stuff. Um, or intersection shaders if it's a, a bounding volume. If it doesn't hit anything, there is a miss shader that is provided as part of the uh, op traceway. And if it doesn't hit anything, the miss shader gets called. Um, instead of callable data KHR, we have ray payload KHR, and we have incoming ray payload KHR. Um, those are exactly identical to the callable data ones. Um, <clears throat> the only reason why they're different is, I guess, because somebody decided they needed to be different. We Honestly, we probably could have made them the same storage class, at least as far as it, our implementation is concerned. Um, and then op traceway, kind of maps to op execute callable with some extra stuff. Um, so it's like execute callable in the sense that it does execute callable shaders, but instead of executing a particular callable shader, it goes off and traces an acceleration structure and executes a bunch of shaders depending on what it hits. Um, let's start with ragegen shaders. So uh, ragegen shaders are specified to the API as a single element shader binding table. Um, so you do have a shader binding table. You have to go fetch some memory to figure out which ray gen shader you're looking at. Um, and then we dispatch it with BTD spawn like any other bindless shader. So the way that C and B traceways KHR 
actually works is we first launch a trampoline compute shader. And this is just a tiny little shader that all it does is it loads the way gen handle. Um, it sets up the per thread scratch space. So each thread has, um, we need to initialize the uh, stack offset to zero. We need to set up the uh, launch IDs, um, which also go in that hot zone that I mentioned. So the hot zone is per thread, the launch ID, which is a three dimensional ID and the scratch offset. So we have to initialize that data um, and then launch the way agent shader with BTD spawn. Um, if you can do an some analysis and figure out that your pipeline only contains one way gen shader or only contains a couple of small way gen shaders, then it is possible to avoid that trampoline and compile it straight to a compute shader. This saves you a little bit of BTD spawn overhead. Um, probably not a whole lot, but it is possible to do that. Um, but from the API perspective, it is fundamentally a bindless shader. It's not a it's not a bound shader because the, the ray tracing pipeline can contain more than one of them and it is passed in through an SBT. Um, so OptTraceWay is similar to OpExecute Callable. Um, it has exactly the same shader splitting and conversion to continuation passing style that OpExecute Callable does. It has exactly the same IO lowering um, modulo the renaming of the storage classes. And it's, it's really very similar. The biggest thing is that it doesn't just call a single shader. It actually interacts with the um, ray tracing hardware that we have. So different ray tracing implementations are different. Um, I didn't tell we have dedicated hardware for doing the ray trace operation. Um, and the way we communicate with it is we set up a, ray data a hardware ray data structure which if you are familiar with the Ray Query extension is basically a Ray Query. Um, in fact, it's exactly the same thing that we use for Ray Query, only where we place it in memory is a little different because of details. Um, this acts as an iterator for the Ray Tracing operation. So think back to your early computer science classes. We know what an iterator is. It walks over a data structure. Um, it points to the root of the BVH, which is the acceleration structure. Um, it contains all of the useful stuff like your rate origin and direction, your hit shader tables, your miss shader pointer, all of that stuff is contained in this ray data structure. Um, so once we've initialized the ray data structure, then we invoke the trace ray to do the actual trace. And it goes off and there's hardware that just magically crawls through the BVH and figures out what gets hit and invokes the various hit shaders. Um, this is very different from the AMD implementation where everything that I just magically hand waved away has to be done in shader code. Um, they do not have hardware for calling the BVH. They have like a couple instructions to accelerate ray triangle intersection, I think. Um, but we have dedicated hardware for it. So I just call off to the hardware and it goes and it does its thing and then it invokes some more shaders. Um, so how do these work? So hit and miss shaders are just callable shaders. There's nothing interesting going on. Um, when we have any built-ins like ray origin, we just look at the ray data iterator and we pull the information out. We stuffed it in there when we executed the trace ray and now we can pull it back out. Um, if we're looking at something like ray geometry index, that comes out of the BVH. Um, we have to, sometimes there are, there's stuff in the ray data iterator that lets us get at the BVH thing that got hit. And so we do that and we read it out of the BVH. Um, and that's the way we get most of the built-in information. Um, any hit shaders uh, are kind of what the same. Um, they have the same built-in stuff where they pull it out of the ray data, the, the geometry index. Um, they, but the any hit shaders don't actually return up the stack. And the reason for this is because you might, the hardware might call any number of them. So we need to, we can't actually return back up to the calling shader until we have actually gotten to the end of our traceway. And so the any hit shaders, they just do their thing and exit. And then the ray tracing hardware continues. Um, the one 
edge case here is if somebody calls op terminate way, then we do actually return up the stack. Um, because at that point, the ray trace operation is done. We want whatever stuff came out of that any hit shader. Um, closest hit and this shaders also return up the stack. So at the end of the traceway operation, we either hit something or we missed. Um, if we hit something, closest hit gets involved, invoked. If we miss something, then the miss shader gets invoked. And in either case, we return up the stack. Um, if for some reason, none of those get invoked, we have a trivial return shader. And this just returns up the stack. So sort of going back to, you know, we talked with the callable shaders, stack returns were easy. You get to the end of the callable shader, you return up the stack. Awesome. With a ray trace operation, though, it's not so simple because you have so many different shaders that can get called. And so we have to have this complex strategy to make sure that one and only one shader does a return. And that's handled by closest hit or miss or the trivial return. Um, I, there's, and again, there's also cases in hit shaders. But th that's why we have to do this whole dance is because we have so many different shaders that can get invoked. We have to make sure that return happens in exactly the last one. Um, and again, there's code for this. You can go read it. Intersection shaders. So intersection shaders don't exist. Um, that's a little tongue in cheek, but it's also really kind of true. So intersection shaders are what gets called when you have an AABB. And AABB stands for, oh, access line bounding box. There we go. Um, and this is the sort of procedural geometry that you have in your acceleration structure. So your acceleration structure has two kinds of things. It has triangles, which are, everybody knows what triangle is, and then AABBs. And these are used for sort of procedural geometry, where the only thing you put in the acceleration structure is the bounding volume, and then an intersection shader gets called, and that computes the hits. In hardware, though, intersection shaders aren't really special. They're just any hit shaders for access line bounding boxes. Um, there's a few dispatch details that are slightly different, but basically they're just any hit shaders. Um, so when we get an op report intersection, which is where the client has said, I have computed an intersection value, here you go. Um, when we get an op report intersection, we set up the hit and then we call the any hit shader. And that can be just a callable shader. We don't, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, and then when we get to the any, end of the any hit shader, depending on what hits we may or may not have gotten, um, we either report the hit or ignore the hit. Um, and when we report the hit, that's just like if a, uh, any hit shader for a triangle accepts the hit. And that doesn't necessarily mean that this is the hit. It just means that this is the, the hit that we know about, and then it goes into all of the closest hit calculations and we take the minimum distance. Um, and invoke the closest hit shader, just like anything else. Um, but so I said they could be a callable shader, and they look kind of like callable. Excuse me. I said that any hit shaders could be callable shaders, and they look kind of like callable shaders from an API point of view. Um, but we don't actually use callable shaders for any hits for AABBs. Um, the API requires that they always come in pairs. So when you create your pipeline, you create a set of shader groups, and the groups are what you actually get handles for. And in the case of AABB geometry, the group is a any hit shader, an intersection shader, and a closest hit shader. And you are guaranteed that the any hit shader and the intersection shader always come together in the pipeline, and we can use that to actually inline the any hit shader into the intersection shader. Um, we have a task for this. It's called BOW no low intersection shader. Uh, if somebody wants to use this in another ray tracing implementation, it is not particularly Intel specific. I just put it there because I didn't want to have boss have to go out and review it. Um, but this allows us to avoid all of the callable data over all of the callable overhead head for the any hit shaders in AABB geometry. Um, how much is that overhead? I don't know. I've never actually tested it with callables. But um, inlining the callable into the intersection shader allows us to avoid whatever overhead is there. And it means that you can fairly freely set up lots of potential hits 
and do you any hit shader without worrying about the ping ponging. So there we go. Um, that is most of the shader stuff. And I am actually, let's see here. How much time do I have? OK, you still have a few minutes, so let's go. We still have um, how many is a few? About nine. OK, I'm not going to get to BBH building in nine minutes. Um, I'll, I'll hit a couple of highlights. Um, so the other thing that we have to do uh, to implement ray tracing is building our acceleration structures. And acceleration structure, um, what we use for our acceleration structures is called, called a BVH, or a bounding volume hierarchy. If you watched my talk from last year, you may remember this slide. Um, so assume, let's say that this is our scene. We've got three things in the scene. We've got a cowboy, we've got a cactus, we've got a cow. And we want to be able to ray trace this scene. But we don't want to have to walk over every single triangle every single time, because that would be horribly slow. So what we do is we build this data structure called a bounding volume hierarchy. And what a bounding volume hierarchy is, is it's a tree-based data structure where you split the scene up into these sort of areas. And then each element of the tree knows the bounding volume of it and its children. So in this particular case, we have the root of the tree, which contains the entire scene. Um, level one, we've got the cowboy, the cactus, and the cow as separate things. Those each have a bounding box that's in red. And then at level two, inside of those things, then we have a bunch of other stuff. And you can imagine that there's more and more levels going down to individual tri triangles. Um, and then when we go to trace array, we can fairly easily eliminate everything from the scene that the ray doesn't intersect, or at least doesn't intersect the volume, bounding volume. And this allows us to do the ray trace operation much, much faster um, without having to walk over everything. Um, so how do we actually go about this? Uh, to bring up the driver, we built a BVH builder on the CPU using Intel's Embly library. Embly is an open source ray tracing framework. Um, it's maintained by Intel. It's on GitHub. You can go look at it. Basically, what we do to build the BVH is first we parse all the Vulkan data into a set of uh, into bounding volumes. So we look at every triangle. We compute the bounding box. Um, then we invoke Embly, and it goes and it sorts all of these bounding volumes into a BVH, and it has alg spatial algorithms to try and figure out where different stuff goes. I'm not going to go into those. And then we read the Embly data structure, and we write out the hardware data structure. Um, this was not uh, exactly a production-ready implementation, but it did have a lot of advantages for driver bring up. Uh, for one thing, it's much easier to see what's going on in your BVH if you can look at it from the CPU. You can fire up GDB, just poke at stuff. Um, and it sort of lets you bring up ray tracing pipelines and GPU BVH building as separate things. Um, it also is really nice if you have to deal with a hardware simulator, which I was dealing with for a while, because uh, trying to do a GPU BVH build on a simulated compute shader is just not a thing that you want to do. Um, We've got an implementation. I think I did post patches for it. Um, it's not really production ready. It spawns threads behind the client's back. It doesn't tie into deferred operation. It's not optimized. It's not something you actually want to use. But when you're trying to bring up ray tracing on a driver, it's a really nice way to do the bring up. It just takes a lot of the variables out of the way for you. Um, but no one cares about CPU BBH builds. Um, don't tell Zach I said that, but I haven't seen an app that really wants it. And DXR doesn't have them at all. Um, and so, uh, like I said, not going to talk about BVH building algorithms. Um, we have to be able to build them on the GPU. So how do we do this? I'm going to try and go through it very quickly. Um, I would like to talk to a few people about this later and maybe a breakout session. Um, so I'm just going to hit it at the 1,000 foot view at 100 mile an hour, and we'll see how it goes. Um, so the way we do a BVH building is we have a bunch of kernels that are written in OpenCLC. Uh, we wrote them in OpenCLC because it's easier to develop and debug that way. Um, and we were going to share the kernels between Vulkan and D3.12. So there wasn't really a common format anyway. Might as well do it in what's easy to do for developers. Um, inside the Mesa patches that I have, um, we compile these at build time and embed them into the driver binary. I wrote a little Intel CLC build tool 
which is based off of all of the same OpenCL stack that Carol and Jesse and Boris have been working on. It does OpenCLC into SPOV using LVM, SPOV into Node, Node into the Intel backend, and it kicks out a binary. Um, and then we've taught the Vulkan driver how to dispatch those kernels. Um, unfortunately, BBH building is complicated. And we don't have just a single OpenCL kernel that goes off of this BBH build. Instead, we have a bunch of kernels that have to be run back to back. And to run those, we have this thing called a meta kernel. Um, so the different kernels have to do different things. So we have to initialize some data. We have to post the API data, run sorting algorithms, dump out the hardware BVH. It's much the same process that we used for the CPU build, but it's done on the GPU. Um, but they might be dispatched with different workgroup sizes. They might have different numbers of dispatches. That's the number of dispatches might not be static and so forth. So we have to have this meta kernel to manage it. Um, so we developed a meta kernel language called Grill. Um, this executes on the command streamer or the command buffer executor thing. Um, it's able to read and write mem values from memory. It's able to do some basic arithmetic, some control flow, and then it can launch a kernel, possibly with indirect dispatch so that it can manage all the different kernels that we have to fire off to the BBH build. Um, we have a poster, it's currently written in Python, uses ply, um, does a tiny bit of optimization, mostly to tone nice human readable typable things into something that's reasonable to actually run. And then it outputs a pile of C, which uses our MI builder thing, which is kind of like no builder for the command streamer. Um, then we have meta meta kernels. Uh, so somebody has to figure out how to launch the meta kernels. So we have code, and this code runs on the CPU, um, but which selects a BBH building algorithm, computes sizes of various scratch memory things, um, allocates memory for inputs, and then it launches the right meta kernels in the right order. Because of course, we can't just launch one meta kernel per build. That would be too easy. Um, so yeah, this is complicated at best. Um, should we have meta, meta, meta kernels? OK, there's my joke slide. Um, so sorry I'm blitzing through this so fast, but I'm trying to sort of get to the open questions because I would like to have some discussions with some other Mesa people here uh, later. So we have a few open questions. Um, one is, can we share code better with Windows? Uh, currently, we share the OpenCL C kernel source in the grill files, but we have different kernel we have different grill file posters, different meta kernel launch code, um, different meta meta kernels. Uh, it's mostly because of impedance mismatches between the way that the Windows drivers are written and the way that the Mesa drivers are written. Um, I didn't really want to duplicate all of the MI Builder stuff um, with another pile of code and wanted to sort of reuse it better, um, wanted something a little bit simpler. But it does mean that every time we pull a new version of the OpenCL kernels stuff potentially gets out of sync. Um, another open question is, can we put more stuff in the Google files themselves? Um, I talked about these meta-meta kernels. We don't really have a good way to show them. If we could pull some of that stuff into the Google files that we use for the meta kernels, maybe we could reduce some of that uh, mismatch problem when we, put, when we sync code between trees, um, or possibly even uh, completely eliminate, allow for almost complete code sharing. Um, unfortunately, probably come at the cost of, of Grill getting a little bit more complex as a language. Um, the other big open question is how much can we share with RADB? Um, ideally, we'd like to share everything we can. Um, we'd love it if we could make some generic Mesa thing that goes off and builds BBHs. Um, but there's some open questions that I don't know the answers to, like can AMD do the same command stream of stuff that Grill requires? If not, how do we do that? Um, how do we abstract? How do we abstract binary BVH formats? Because maybe we don't want to use the same formats. Um, maybe RADV should just use the Intel BVH format because AMD doesn't specify a BVH format. So maybe they can just use ours. I don't know. Um, there's a lot of stuff to talk about with the RADV developers. So hopefully we'll be have the opportunity to do that sometime this week. Um, should we compile Google files to Node? Currently we have a little Python thing that's hand rolled that has a little mini IR in it. It does the parsing. It does a little bit of optimizations. Um, maybe we should just have a node backend that generates MI commands via MI builder. 
Um, as much as I wish this were a joke, this is not the joke slide. I have seriously considered doing this. If we're sharing with RADV, this might actually be a good choice because they're going to need to emit a completely different set of stuff with their command streamer. And maybe just having it in an actual IR is a good idea. Um, again, lots of open questions. So um, I managed to get to the end of the slides in time. I'm sorry I had to blitz through the last bit. But hopefully you found at least the first two thirds of the presentation to be interesting and informative. Um, and I'm open for questions now. And before I finish up, I am required to tell you all that Intel is hiring and we are looking for more 3D driver developers. So if you want to, um, please talk to me on IRC. Um, I'm not required to tell you that. I want to tell you that we want more people on our team. We would love to have some of you join us. So uh, with that, I'll open it to questions. Okay, it looks like we don't have any questions incoming from IRC at the moment. So uh, we're also a little bit over time. So we probably have to move on for now. But if you want to, please create a breakout session and share the link to Jitsi on IRC. Uh, yeah, I will try to do that this afternoon. At okay. Some point. All right. Thank you very much for your. Okay. Wait. No. Vinimo asks, when will be a good time to discuss BVH building? Um, anytime while XDC is happening. Um, we have SSA based register allocation this afternoon. Uh, tomorrow, I and I will try to schedule something. Okay. And Hopefully Bas... not on top of the okay. register. And next, 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 next. Bass New Head and asks, any games run a kit? Um, I cannot say that right now. Okay, let's go. Uh, we are very over time, so let's move on. Thank you very much for your terrific talk and have a great conference. Thank you.